Hello from the heartland. My name is Jenna, and this is Smarter News. News when it matters and why it matters. Our Smarter series features unique people who help us think and live smarter. I have a quick story just to kick us off for this conversation because it really speaks to why why this topic is so fascinating. So today I'm doing the regular holiday grind that so many parents are doing where your children are in school for just a couple hours before you have to pick them up. I have my son with me who's sick, who happens to be sick and not going to school today. So I have 90 minutes of drop off, a sick kid, the kids have to get picked up in just another hour because they're not in school at all during the before the holiday. <laughs> and as I'm walking in, I say to my nine-year-old, I said, listen, I just need you, I, I, we're going to put something on TV. It's fine. It's no big deal. I just need a little bit of quiet because I have an interview. And he <laughs> says, well, what is the interview? What is the interview about? And I said, well, the, the interview is about this poem that is 200 years old <laughs> and it's got this amazing history. And I just, you know, I'm going through, I'm trying to make breakfast for him. I, and I just start saying, twas the night before Christmas and all through the house. And I stop and he picks up. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care. And he's walking back to the, <laughs> the back room, <laughs> which just speaks to, look, at, think about that. The poem is 200 years old. And when I say twas the night before Christmas... We all know what comes after it. How is that even possible? So that's what we're going to talk about today. But here's the other twist. Not only is this poem, which is officially a visit from St. Nicholas, although we often all call it Twas the Night Before Christmas, not only is the poem 200 years old, but there's also periodically been a little bit of drama and mystery around this poem and who wrote it. Although I think we're going to solve that today. So joining us is Pamela McCall. She's an author and historian, and she wrote the book, that so many of us needed, which establishes a collective history and context for the poem. It's the title of the book is Twas the Night, the Art and History of the Classic Christmas Poem. And I love that, the art and the history. Pam, how did you come up with that title? And how did you even become interested in this poem? Because it is a poem that we all just sort of hear, it sort of washes over us every season, but you don't think, well, geez, I wonder, you know, what is this poem all about? Tell us a little bit about how you got interested in all of this. Sure. In 2012, I was working on a smoke-free campaign for smoke-free movies. And uh, I was a publisher at the time and I wanted to do something. So I took the pipe out of the poem, this very famous much loved poem, and no one had ever done that before. And so Stephen Colbert did a spoof on me and Barbara Walters on The View, and everybody got really excited about the fact that I'd got Santa to quit smoking. And, you know, it was a really big story. Associated Press and Vanity Fair and NBC Nightly News. And I mean, it went kind of crazy. It was covered in China and India that a woman had got Santa Claus to quit smoking. So, you know, I set out to sort of call attention to smoke-free movies and protecting kids from Joe Camel and the image of cartoon characters smoking. And I ended up with this big platform, which was great. But at that time, I realized that it was turning 200. And I thought, well, with my history background and my education and my art, my love of art and my education in art, what a great project. But I didn't really realize um, how in depth I'd have to go. So I had 10 years to work on it because that was 2012 when I decided to do this. And, uh, you know, over the 10 years, I spent a great deal of time researching the poem and uh, all the art, that the art is so staggering. And that's why it's called The Art and the History of the Classic Christmas Poem, because the art legacy of this poem is exceptionally brilliant. Um, I, I'm so, so excited to talk to you about that, because that's another yeah. reason that this poem is so significant in American culture and quite frankly, beyond because right. so many credit the poem and the description of Santa with giving us the picture of Santa. In fact, I have something right by me. Here's a picture of Santa. Um, yeah. The way that we imagine him, which we all have yeah. the very, and, I don't want to say very this, similar. This is my book, right? This is my book. So, you know, this, yes, is let me see that, this is the Santa that I chose to put on my cover. You know, this really loving, sort of endearing character. And uh, yeah. But, well, let me go back because when you said yes. that, that Santa was smoking, I actually kind of forgot about that point in the poem. So I thought I would read. I thought I would read it. <laughs> I read it for our audience so we can reflect on this. This uh, how how Pam ignited a global controversy with getting Santa to stop smoking. So here's the lines: right. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe 
he held tight in his teeth and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. So he was, he was a smoker, Santa. And I, I completely blocked that out. So maybe the campaign worked. <laughs> <laughs> don't associate it with the pipe anymore. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, people who, I mean, I was criticized heavily by a lot of people. And, you know, um, I always like to say, you know, we got rid of Joe Camel for a reason, right? Um, there was science that showed that, you know, cartoon characters, especially influential ones, smoking, it doesn't make a six year old run out and buy a package of cigarettes. What it does is sympathizes towards tobacco products later in life. And so, that's so interesting. And yes, you don't see too many images right now, modern images with Santa. Okay, so let's get back to the get back to this poem. So first of all, where are you from, Pam? Where were you born I'm a and Canadian. raised? What I'm was from, Christmas? I'm from I'm from Vancouver, but I work out of Ashland, Ohio with Baker and Taylor. They're my distributor and I've worked with them for 20 years. And so do, what was Christmas like for you as a child? Do you remember reading this poem or reciting it? Oh, sure. I'm 65, so I was born in 1958. So my father gave me my first edition when I was four. I still have it. And um, I think they're smoking on every page of the one I have. But the 60s <laughs> were an amazing time because, you know, it was the introduction of things like tinsel Christmas trees, like little silver trees. And, and you know, we were, um, I was at the end of the baby boom. So we had a lot of toys, Mattel, and all of this Barbie, you know, Barbies came out. Of so course. Christmas was big. And our house was always full of um my mother was very much entertaining, so we had a lot of, you know, neighborhood parties, and it was just great. And we had, one of the things I specifically remember is we had got a lot of Christmas cards, and my mother used to string them up and put them in bowls. That's how many we had. And I think Christmas cards, it's sort of sad that we don't still do that as much. I think Christmas cards are wonderful. It's a lovely time of the year to send a little message to somebody. And, and again, the art on Christmas cards, you know, I see them in all the shops, but I wonder how many people still do it. Well, at our household, we're still getting the influx. And every time I open one up, I feel guilty that ours hasn't gone up the house yet. So <laughs> I still have some do. time. <laughs> <laughs> I still have some time. So let's talk about this, the year that this poem was published, 1823. Talk to us about what was going on in 1823. When did this poem first appear? It first appeared in the Troy Sentinel newspaper in upstate New York on December the 23rd of 1823. And uh, at that time, especially in Manhattan and New York, it wasn't really a Christmas Eve family event. It was more like a rowdy street festival with lots of drinking and um, merriment and guns going off and fireworks. I mean, this kind of thing. And, and, and so there was a real effort to try and make it more family, more you know, inside and safer. Um, it was kind of getting out of control. <laughs> so, and so was poem, that, and that was the tra- and that was the tradition in the streets that people were going out and kind of causing a ruckus on Christmas Absolutely. Misrule, the old sort of style of Twelfth Night and Misrule. And, you know, which harps back to the Roman Empire and Saturnalia, where, you know, Saturnalia, um, everything was fair game. And they used to roll reverse. So, you know, slaves would be the masters and the masters would be the slaves. And all of that went on. But in not in Manhattan, of course, but certainly there was an element of Misrule. And one of the um, influential individuals at the time, John Pitard, had had a very scary encounter with his daughter, where these revelers um, had come into the house. And it's kind of like Christmas carolers who come to the door and ask for something. But these people came in and they stayed and they took what they wanted. And they were um, they scared him. And it's, so they sort of had this idea, let's create something else. Let's do something else. Let's, let's promote interior Christmas, family Christmas. And uh, this poem was part of that. And who wrote the poem? Clement C. Moore is a very wealthy American, graduated from Columbia University. His father was the president of Columbia. And uh, Clemency Moore wrote this poem for his six children. He goes on to have nine children. So he had his hands full too. <laughs> that sounds like a lot of kids. I don't think I, I, I got three. So nine <laughs> sounds like a lot. Nine. <laughs> I need and a lot of poems small, at that small point. Small for the day too, you know, in 14, 15, when I don't think it was uncommon. But um, so he wrote it for his children. And then uh, when it was published in 1823, it was immediately a success. And it was published in other papers and almanacs shortly thereafter. And then it just continued to snowball. And every year, you even see it called the annual Christmas poem. So everybody, you know, started to publish it and, and loved it immediately. Okay, but it was published anonymously in the, in the first paper that it appears in in 1823. There's right. no author on it. And that right. continues for many years, which is how we eventually get to a controversy, which we'll, we'll get to in a moment. But why? Why Why was it published anonymously? Why wouldn't Clement Seymour put his name to it? 
Well, for two, a couple of reasons. One, um, he was a scholar, an academic, very serious individual as far as um, his writings. He was a professor at the General Theological Seminary. And he didn't really, I think, have any intention of writing it for the public. He wrote it for his children. And an individual who visited the home, Harriet Butler, decided to transcribe it along with some other poems of his out of the family album, out of the front hall. They used to have family albums in the front hall that people who were guests of the home could read and, and leave leave poems or salutations or do a little drawing or whatever else in his family albums. And so she copied it out and she took it up to Troy and gave it to the paper. <laughs> and then Moore finds out about this in 1837, so 15, 14, 15 years later. And uh, he writes to the editor and says, how did you get hold of this poem of mine? And then he tells him the story. But by that point, um, it's very, very famous and loved, and Moore puts his name to it. And I think uh, he signs five copies of it later in life. He puts it in his own collection of poetry, and he defends it in the paper when someone gives credit to someone else. So it's by 1837, it, it, is, it is Moore's, and very well established as Moore's. But with, was there a period of time where he did not realize at all that this poem was becoming so famous? For that yeah. period of time where he didn't realize, and he the, he just had no idea. I think so, but I but we don't really know that. Um, it, you know, he really doesn't step into the conversation until eighteen thirty seven, so we don't really know. Uh, some of his students, though, at the General Theological Seminary, some notes from I think eighteen twenty eight when they talk about Moore's poem. So it may have been known in circles around Moore, and uh, but back in the day, I mean, a lot of people publish their work anonymously. Sir Walter Scott doesn't put his name to anything until 1828. It's a different era. And women would never have put their name in the paper. They would submit poetry all the time anonymously. It wasn't acceptable. It was notorious. You, you wouldn't have wanted to see your name in the paper as a woman. Um, and I think a lot of men, too. Copyright wasn't an issue so much. And a lot of these uh, things, too, uh, you know, they sort of come from an oral tradition. And so a lot of these things different poems and songs and things maybe weren't possibly all original of the person who later takes credit to them that they were heard and and written down such as the case of Robbie Burns you know with his New Year's song you know he admits that he wrote that down after hearing it from someone else and yet we credit Robbie Burns with it which is really interesting um, that but, is so uh, interesting so, so a lot of things were anonymous then so and and just what a contrast to today's age where you know, social media is so prolific. Everyone's putting their face and their names and their their voice to so many different things. What a different right. time just to reflect on in 200 years. So who is Mr. or excuse me, Major Henry Livingston? How is that name relevant to this conversation about who wrote the poem? Well, 60 years after Twas Night Before Christmas appears in print, the Livingstons start to talk amongst themselves about their relative, Henry Livingston II, who's the same ge generation as Clement Moore's father. So it's a different era. It's earlier. And uh, and they come up with this theory uh, based on family story that it was indeed Henry Livingston who wrote it, not Clement Moore. And, you know, just think of your own family. Like, just think of that. 60 years is a long time to have heard something. <laughs> And to, and to use that as evidence to deny someone the right to the authorship who said it was his, signed his name to it, and defended it, and put it in his own book of, of poetry. It's a big leap, and it's a, it's a rather um, outlandish thing to attempt to do um, without hard evidence, which they don't have any. So it's all conjecture and family stories. And, you know, just think about that. Like, if, if you know my children were to start a story that someone had done something 60 years before, you know, based on just hearsay, you know, I, I, I and I don't know how it's gained so much, um, so, so much uh, steam. I mean, Hallmark did a movie of it last year. You know, there's been this mock trial. I was part of that trial, a theatrical trial based on this de authorship debate. I think it's really, um, it's just more of a, a theatrical sort of idea than it is anything really serious. And, I've developed that attitude even more working on this so much um, that the Livingstons really don't have too much, to, very little to stand on. So, and I think because I got to know more a lot by researching his life and his education and his, his outlook on the world and his uh, very, he was a very humble, um, generous man that I'd have a hard time believing he outright lied. I have a really hard time mm. with that. 
I don't think that's part of his makeup. There was no reason for him to do that. Um, it's just not his character. <laughs> so very, very honorable man. And I just don't think that he would have lied the way that they, you have to, he has to have lied outright to make the case for Henry Livingston. And it doesn't make sense. It's also the wrong well, era it, because as I talked about, you know, 1810, 1820, this is when Christmas was really getting going through Washington Irving in New York and through John Petard. And Henry Livingston is earlier than that. So it doesn't make sense to me um, because this, the winds were swirling around Manhattan to create this whole poem. And there, there were other poems just before it which described a saintly bishop character coming in a sleigh with one reindeer the year before. And then Washington Irving in 1809 has uh, in Knickerbocker, St. Nicholas flying over the skies of Manhattan in a wagon. So this is all sort of leading up to Twas, right? And James Fenmore Cooper um, in The Pioneers writes about going home to Santa Claus on Christmas Eve. First time in English language we ever see Santa Claus, 1821. So it's too early, the Livingston story. It, it doesn't make sense to me from a historical point of view. Well, it's it's so fascinating to hear you say this. I have looked at this poem, we've talked a little bit about the history of this poem on Spiral News mm -hmm. for the last few years. And one of the things we really struggled with is finding a voice of authority because you, you're you right. There is an indulgence. I mean, I'm even guilty of it too. This indulgence of, well, there's a little something here. And is this, who really, who really published this because there's no name to it. And then you're kind of, you go through like a game of clue. And also I think everyone feels like they have a relationship with Santa in some way <laughs> right, and have sure. a relationship with this poem. And so yeah. this is sort of brought into it too. And so it's a, it's a very curious, interesting side story, but I didn't realize that the claims by the family towards this poem happened so many decades later, which sounds right. quite significant that right. they had said that, Oh wait, he, he wrote it many, many years before this was published. And, but they didn't mention it really publicly until many, many years after. So there's this big time frame uh, that it spans that, as you point out, maybe yeah. raises some more questions. They also say it was published in a couple of newspapers, and yet they've got the, the, the newspapers, when they say that this was published, didn't exist at the time that they said it was published. <laughs> so that's problematic. Um, yes. But it's also problematic in that when this was published in 1823, it caught on immediately and was shared. So if it was published in a newspaper earlier with Henry Livingston, why didn't it catch on then? It's good. It, it, it had a, loves it, 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 right? Yes, yes. It had a, it was having a viral moment <laughs> just yes, in, so a, in exactly. a different way. So did it just get passed over when he, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But the, also the oldest edition of this poem is in the handwriting of Clement Seymour's Godfather's Daughter from 1824 Watermark Paper. So we have that. So it, it's just... I don't know. I, I just a very hard push um, to give it to Livingston, or even to um, give that argument much credibility. But, well, that's good to know. After ten years of research, uh, yeah. I appreciate your your expertise yeah. on this. What what stands out most to you about the poem? We say, oh, it caught on right away, and we have some mm -hmm. historical context for the movement to bring Christmas back to the family and inside. But what do you think, having looked at it for so many years, is truly the magic of this poem? Well, it starts, um, it's really based on the St. Nicholas legend of the third century of the Roman Empire, where St. Nicholas comes at night to uh, throw gold through a window, so anonymous giving, uh, looking out for someone else, because he's doing this to save these two young women from being sold into slavery, because their father doesn't have money to buy them dowries, to buy them into marriage. So things have changed, thank heavens. <laughs> We're not buying our way into marriages. <laughs> We're not being sold into slavery. The... Um, so this is the story. And so when you bring that thread all the way through up into you know the world of Clement C. Moore, it's this idea of anonymous giving and generosity of spirit. And uh, I think that it's really important that Clement C. Moore, because of his theological training and his outlook on life, he took away the thread of punishment. So in this poem, there is no naughty or nice. And prior to this, St. Nicholas had come along with judgment and a birchen rod. And if you were naughty, you didn't get a good present. You got a swack, either with a stick or, or something else. So, you know, this is really significant because children at the, in the era would have loved this because it's just jolly and merry and kind and good and magical and full of wonderment and creative thought. And uh, he even says in the language, there's nothing to dread. 
So I always say, you know, it's been read, read by the first lady of the United States since 1953 at the White House to Children. And I can't imagine Michelle Obama sitting down to read this if it talked about a birch and rod and children being beat up. <laughs> so that's why it survived, because it doesn't have that. If it had have had the birch and rod, it would have gone the way of the dustbin. And, and we wouldn't be celebrating this poem today because we thankfully have moved past that concept. However, um, Naughty and Nice has worked its way back into our Christmas songs and our Christmas messaging. And when I'm driving around on this book tour 50 days, I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone referencing Naughty or Nice. I find it fascinating. Um, where's that coming from? Like, you know, culturally, we sort of live in a non-judgmental or, you know, Western culture, non-judgmental, you know, if you're Christian values would be non-judgmental. So I find it really interesting that we're caught up in this naughty or nice, which is external external refereeing on our behavior. It's odd. <laughs> you know? That's so interesting. I've never thought about that, especially when I'm looking back and and I again I'll make sure to to put a good link to the the poem mm -hmm. because it's something again that we can all recite, but it's nice to read through it. As you're talking, I'm looking over it still and thinking about. Yes, that's right. You know, Santa Claus in this poem is described as a jolly person, but also a little businesslike, like he has a job to do and he's going to come and do it. And then he's like yeah. going to go on his way. But there's not a lot of there, sin. There's the naughtiness, that sort of part gone. of it isn't in this poem. It, no, right. it's gone. It's happy and it's loving and it's kind. And it's, it is the legend of St. Nicholas. It is this person who comes at night anonymously without wanting self-gratification or, or reward or thank you even, he comes at night and he delivers things. I mean, in St. Nicholas, it's for, it's for people who are in need. But so much of our um, Christmas is still looking out for children and people in need at this time of the year. That, that concept is certainly part of our empty stocking funds and Santa Claus toy drives and all these things. So that aspect is certainly very much part of Christmas. But this poem is, it's survived because it's jolly, it's happy, it's full of merriment and wonder and magic and creative thought, but it's also something that is read to a child very early in their childhood and it's tied up in the memory of Christmas. And so like, I just read this poem to my two-year-old granddaughter, Ruby, and I watched, I watched her listening to me and her little eyes were twinkling and she was like, I thought, this and we have this great relationship so i thought this is what this is about it's this building of it's often read to a child by a grandparent or a parent and and it's just built into this love right that we have for the poem but also for these children and it's just part of family and it's part of part of legacy and tradition and uh, i cannot tell you how many times people come up to me and say oh our family reads this every year we gather together and i thought you and the rest of the world <laughs> You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like right. they say it as they're, they're the only ones who do it. <laughs> like, well, that's the collective. That's the collective tradition. The collective magic. You know, let's look at these lines. He had a broad face and a yeah. little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. And so I, it's just right. Right? Exactly what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. This happy, full, jolly Saint Nick, you know, Santa yes. Claus. Who's an elf. He's an elf. And this is the other thing Who's an elf? does. He takes him out of the bishop character and he turns him into an elf, specifically says he's an elf. And that takes it into the whole secular world. So, you know, this has been translated into every major language, including Yiddish. So you could be any faith-based, you know, individual and uh, enjoy this poem. He's an elf. And if you have a problem with elves, then you might not enjoy this poem. But, you know, if you're good with elves, then you're okay. But, right? And there are what people is, that have problems with is, elves. And so they, you know. <laughs> well, I've learned through my work, Pam, that someone has a problem with everybody at this point. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's in that way we have a, we have a similarity of all our differences. What, what was sort of one of the, I'm sure there's many different things that you've learned, but what did, when you look back at this work and now you're on this amazing book tour and, uh, and you've done this a couple of times, by the way, because last year was the anniversary of the writing of the poem. And this right. year is the anniversary of the publishing of the poem. Right. And obviously you're amazing to speak with. So I'm sure these are really fun, cool events. 
but as you have these moments where you're interacting with a lot of different people and you're thinking about your work, does anything in particular really stand out that you'd like to share with our audience that it was like this fascinating nugget that you found or something that you think a lot of people miss in this conversation? Well, I mean, as far as my research goes, I found, uh, as I talked about at the beginning, it's the art legacy. And I did this little um, exercise where I think of someone I love, like Maxwell Parrish, you know, an artist I love. And I think, okay, now you don't associate Maxwell Parrish with Santa Claus. I mean, that just does not come to mind. But I thought, I'm going to go looking for this and see if he ever did it. And sure enough, he did St. Nicholas for uh, Washington Irving's Knickerbocker. And he also designed the facade of the St. Nicholas Museum that was destined for Manhattan, but that never was built. And, and then I'd go to Andrew Wyeth, you know, the great Andrew Wyeth. And I'd go, one of my favorite artists. You know, in Christina's world, one does not think about Santa Claus. It just doesn't equate, right? But when the, I read about the, and the Wyeth family, and they were so into Christmas, they really were, just like Mark Twain's family. And uh, when I was looking for Andrew Wyeth and Santa Claus, I found a red and white stocking on the end of the bedpost in the open window. You know, that was the, that, those were the finds that I just, and Andrew, and Andrew, Andy Warhol, 1981, of course, the Miss series with Santa Claus, but it just kept going. And, and it was hard to find an artist who hadn't come to Santa Claus or Knickerbocker, of course, but also Twas Night for Christmas. And I found that just astounding. <laughs> Do you think that would happen if we didn't have this poem, that this poem didn't establish at least a little vision, a collective vision of what Santa Claus looked like? Do you think it, we'd have that art today without mm -hmm. this poem? No, I do not. I do not. I mean, Knickerbocker, Washington Irving does a lot to get St. Nicholas flying around the skies. He gets that going. But I don't think so. This poem is so significant. And it was supported by so many great artists, but also people like Walt Disney. Walt Disney comes to it in a really big way. So does Coca-Cola. Some people who've got some real PR behind them and some real muscle, like as far as like getting it out there, real marketing muscle. And they take this all over the world. And, uh, you know, I, people say Coca-Cola, but they gave him a great PR campaign. No matter what you think of Coca-Cola, um, it was magnificent. They took him to every corner of the world. During his life, uh, getting back to Clement Seymour, as you mentioned, he's a scholar. He's really well-respected. Did he benefit from the poem? Has his family benefited from the poem in any significant way? Did, did people introduce him as, hey, guys, look who's here. It's the author for this amazing poem that now we're all reciting. What was it like for him? I don't, you know... He was very much an academic and, uh, and also very, very wealthy. They owned all of Chelsea. They, his grandfather named Chelsea after the Chelsea Hospital in London because he was a, a retired major from the British Army and he came to America and buys up all this land of Chelsea. So extremely wealthy family. And his other, the, his more side of the family um, owned Queens and Elmhurst. So, you know, amazing. So he didn't really do this for money and he certainly didn't make a lot of money off of it. He did sign five copies of it and sign his name to it. Those copies have subsequently sold through the years, and they're worth between five hundred thousand and seven hundred fifty thousand dollars each. And lots of the memorabilia and some of the vintage collection, uh, vintage editions, are worth a lot of money, as are the original illustrations for some of the key um, illustrators. But Moore himself, no, I don't think so. His book of poetry probably didn't sell very well, and uh, he wouldn't have made any money off of this that I can think of. Um, and nor would his relatives have because it was public domain from the beginning of time um, because it was published anonymously without copyright. So he never made any money off of it that I know of. And uh, the Moore family still owns some of the key things. His daughter did a beautiful address, uh, illustrated illumination of this in 1855. They still own that. That's probably worth a great deal of money. Um, and they still own a lot of portraits of Moore. But no, no, he, um, he didn't uh, seek this, nor did he get rewarded for it nor do any of his descendants. And to know that it was in a matter of public domain from the very beginning, by the way, yes. for all of our audience at Smarter News, having a artwork or photograph in public domain for our news organization is really important because it means that we can share it freely. We don't have to worry about uh, any sort of credit and it, it it allows a lot of access to the work in ways that can be great when it's used positively, but that also means that a lot of people can use it in whatever way they they deem. So uh, when you see something that's very prolific, like a, a famous photo or 
sometimes even a, a famous work of art, depending on whether or not it's in the public domain, one of the reasons you may be seeing it repeatedly is because everybody has access to it. Let's just as we finish up here, uh, Pam, I'm curious about this one part of the poem I wanted to ask you about. I do love the reindeer. The reindeer, that's something that stands out, Donner and Blitzen. Do you want to just give us a little bit about the reindeer? Would I be remiss in not talking about the reindeer names? Is that an well, important part the of this eight, poem? Or? I mean, war is credited with the eight reindeer. There's no doubt about that. You know, there's some thought that the reindeer come from a stable of horses. Uh, we don't have any documentation of that, but that's a theory. And uh, both Sir Walter Scott and Washington Irving talk about Donner and Blitzen. But that's also a common German and Dutch term for thunder and lightning. It's like, you know, how we say like, oh, blast or something that they'd say, oh, you know, Donner and Blitzen. It was like, it was like, you know, sort of expression. But uh, the reindeer are key because they're so magical and fun and children really enjoy them. Um, so that's a big piece of it. But uh, that's about, you know, the other thing about reindeer is people say, well, where'd they come from? But even the Romans had documentation of, you know, human beings domesticating reindeer for transportation and, and dairy um, way back. So if the Romans were talking about reindeers, you know, drawing sleighs, they knew that in the north people did do that with reindeer. So it's not really, you know, it, it's not really that unusual to have them flying through the sky with Santa. <laughs> You know, and the red well, nose, is so, sort of a, you know, it comes with Rudolph much later, but um, it's natural to reindeer, actually. It is a species of reindeer that actually have a, a flush nose. So kind of interesting. Well, again, it underscores the the cultural impact. Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donder, Blitzen. We wouldn't know them if it wasn't for this particular poem. So here's the final part, though. Happy Christmas to all and to all a good night. Happy Christmas, not Merry Christmas. Right. Was it happy Christmas for was happy Christmas? What was said at the time? I'm so curious about that because now it's Merry Christmas to all. Yes, it and was to very, all a good night. It was happy Christmas and, and more in the original, it is happy Christmas. But we've taken a lot of liberties with this poem. And even from the very beginning, you know, people edited it. They changed the punctuation, they changed the title. It was published as an account of a visit from St. Nicholas. It goes on to be Twas the Night Before Christmas, the night before Christmas many many titles for this thing and uh they edited they change words you know all kinds of things change and happy christmas turns to merry christmas but um you know i think the happy christmas is really uh, perfect for this poem because that's exactly what it is it's a happy you know masterpiece of juvenile fiction and it delights children and uh exactly as it was originally written you don't have to change anything except for maybe lose the pipe um and children <laughs> yeah. you know children really enjoy it but uh no, it's been a joy to work on. And every time I see a grandparent buy my book or buy a copy of my 200th edition that I, I published the poem as well in multiple languages, whenever I see that, it gives me a good feeling because I know that somebody's going to read it to a little kid and this little child is going to have this legacy built into them and it's going to carry on because it'll be tied into family Christmas. And, and that's so wonderful. And I think just one last thing, it's good to put this in context that, um, Charles Dickens wrote Christmas Carol 20 years after this. So people think it's a lot earlier. No, twas is earlier. So Yeah. And is there any doubt in your mind that another 200 years from now we'll be celebrating the 400th anniversary I of think the publishing? So. I think so. It's so well loved. And it's so, um, it's just so good. It's so, it's just such a great poem. And it's easy to recite, easy to remember. And uh, it just sends the right message. You know, it's not a big lesson thing, it, but it does have a lovely message, right? <laughs> You're right. You're right. It doesn't hit you over the head. You can yeah, actually just like enjoy it. <laughs> right? You don't have, there's no big lesson yes. thing here. It's really just to be enjoyed. <laughs> it's really important yes. sometimes. Let's just have it. Oh. Let's just enjoy ourselves, you know? <laughs> It's such a relief. You're right. I just just can just take it all in. Do you have a favorite part of the poem, Pam? And does it just do you just recite it off the cuff? Just just no problem. Complete completely memorized. And is there I, a, a favorite I mean, I line? I, I often ask an audience. I'm not going to quiz you. No, I often <laughs> ask the audience. I'll pass my book around and I'll have everyone read a line from it, um, which is always fun. But um, and sometimes there's some guest stars that come and read it who are you know like opera stars of people it's always fun to hear renditions but i think one of the fun ones you can go and look up on youtube is prince charles now king charles he and camilla and maggie smith and daniel craig and uh, judy dench and a bunch of other people they do it for an actor's benevolent fund and it's really good i think it's 2020 but king charles is 
I mean, I probably shouldn't say this, but he's probably into a couple of sherries because he's having a really good time and he's <laughs> reading this poem and laughing away and it's, it's just really fun to see. Can I ask you to take a slight step to your left for me, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> That's perfect. With a little old driver so lively and quick. I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came. And he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen. On Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall. Now dash away, dash away, dash away all. Is there one line that sticks out most to you of the whole oh, thing? Oh, right. You asked me that. Um, I guess the first two lines, because it just, the minute you say the first two lines, everybody sort of chips in, you know, they sort of, then they go on. And uh, I'm doing a big speech because I nominated Clement Seymour into the New York State Library Hall of Fame, and they're inducting him on December 19th. And I think I might start my speech with Twice the Night Before Christmas and All Through the House. Not a creature was stirring, not even a, and then see exactly. if they all, right? Like, who doesn't know those two lines, right? And if you, so, if they don't, they're out. They get kicked out. That's right. They have to do that. <laughs> that's, it. that's it. I have to have some fun. Wow, that's amazing. Well, this is this is extraordinary. Uh, I wish I had your. I will have your book in my hands because I think it's really an important work. I encourage our audience to also do the same. It is literally the only thing out there of its kind with this sort of history. And we weren't sure this interview was going to come together and right. it did just kind of last minute. Otherwise I'd have it in my hand. So no thank much. you for your work, um, Pamela, and, and taking the time to really dig in and understand this really important, uh, this really important piece of work that I don't think any of us can listen to or read without smiling and feeling joyful, but also now have an understanding of what it really means for the history of Christmas and how we imagine Christmas in our head. All of that magic, a lot of it can be traced to this poem. So thank you for being the purveyor and the explorer of that for, for all of us. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. And maybe this Christmas, maybe drop the naughty or nice. You know, I was talking to a son the other day and he said, a little boy, I said, he said to the little boy, have you been naughty or nice? And the little boy turned to his mother and said, what do you think, mom? And I thought, oh, <laughs> oh, you know, <laughs> let's, let's, let's just, let's just let kids be kids and let's just, let's just have a season of forgiveness and forget it, you know, just forget the, the bad for a little time. And just, just enjoy I like this. that. He's one of the little children. We... Everybody's trying their best, aren't they? I think so. Well, and um, I will confess that our family periodically has been guilty of mentioning switches. So maybe we just need, I, I will take this as a sign, Pam, that I need to drop that. Well, I, I mean, I think I it's do. like, they, they know, these little people, they know they, how to right. They know if they've been naughty or nice. They don't need us. Yeah, anyway. It's <laughs> well, this has been a joy. Pamela, thanks Great. so much for your, the time. I know it's been a, it's such a busy season, and particularly this year. So thank you so thank much for you. taking the time to join us. And happy Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Quick, concise, nonpartisan, smarter news, a refuge from the storm. I'm Jenna. Thank you for choosing Smarter. Smarter.